Hello everyone, Human Hard Drive here. Uh, today we're going to be doing another AVRC tutorial. Today we're going to be talking about generating external pin interrupts. Now, external pin interrupts are generated by the actual pins on the Atmega itself. These uh, the interrupts are generated based upon several various logic changes, which we will talk about. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about the circuit I've got going. Uh, start with got the LED, of course, hooked up to pin 14 here, and that's got a resistor, and that's just going out to ground. And then over here, I've got a wire, which is connected to pin 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, on the Atmega, and that's being broken out here to a couple extra wires, which I have connected to some alligator leads running to this nice switch, this little tactile switch we have here. And then that's just running through another jumper, and that's connected to ground. Uh, so, for the hardware we have here, the code, it should all make sense. So, why don't we go look at that code. Okay, so I talked about pin... Oh, whoops-a-daisy. talked about pin 5. Where is my scrolling ability? There we go. That's what I wanted to look at. Okay, so why pin 5? Well, if we look, pin 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 has attached to it something called INT1. And there's another pin similar to its name called INT0. These are two external interrupt pins. Now, the reason I've chosen INT1 over INT0 was just I chose INT1 over INT0. There's really no preference. However, if you look at some of the other pins, you can see attached to them, they have names like PC int. Uh, 13, PC int 5, PC int 21. These are also external interrupt pins. The difference between the PC int and the simply int is this. Int 0 and int 1 have independent interrupt controls. By that I mean they have their own interrupt vectors. I can select INT 0 or INT 1. The PC ints I have to deal with a range. I can't select just say PC int 6 and monitor that with its own specific interrupt vector. I have to say monitor all the PC ints from 0 to 7, then from 8 to 15, then 16 to 24. So I like precise control as opposed to ambiguous control. So that's what we're going to be doing. It's exactly the same. Um, for the PC ints as the ints, you just have to choose a couple different things, and we'll talk about what those different things are. But for now, let's set up for the int 1. So if you come over here to external interrupts, wow, that is really zoomed in. Let's zoom out a bit. There we go. Okay. So the way this works is it's based upon the uh, clock cycle of the chip. So every change you do, be that um, rising edge, falling edge, or uh, logic level, you have to, that pulse has to last longer than one clock cycle. So in our case, one twenty millionth of a second. So it doesn't have to last that long, but you can see where that will become an issue later. So to start with, let's set up this. We're going to say include, obviously AVR move that out of the way, AVR, we're going to include the interrupt, and I'm also going to define FCPU, because it's 20, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 20 million, it's always a good idea to have FCPU defined, because you never know when you're going to need it, and it doesn't take up that much space. Okay, so let's start by defining the output we're going to be looking at, which is pin 14, which, as we all remember, is port B equals, uh, no, not port B, DDRB equals 1 shifted left into port B0. So that makes that an output, and port B equals 1 shifted left into port B0. And we're going to just set that up so it's on at the beginning of the program. Now, let's come back to this. If you read through this, you you'll find out that I, the PC int and the ints don't have to be configured as inputs for the interrupt to be triggered because you can actually write to the pin 
as an output and it will register that change so that's really good not just for inputs but also controlling outputs so that's useful now let's talk about the int uh, another difference between the int 0 and int 1 as opposed to the PC int is you have four degrees of control you can choose from a low logic level a logic change meaning it toggles a falling edge it goes from high to low or the rising edge going from low to high so you can choose between these four logic states um, in this case I'm going to choose the low level and I'll explain why just a little bit later actually for the low level I don't have to deal with it but I am going to say port D equals one shifted left into port D3 port D3 is pin 5 or int 1 uh, what that does is I'm enabling the pull-up resistor for well to get rid of the floating issue which we should always be cognizant of okay so that's that so I don't have to deal with these you can just ignore that for now uh, this is the same for INT 0 not dealing with INT 0 at the moment okay the E mask uh, this is where we set up the interrupt enable so for this we're just going to say E mask equals one oops, one shifted left into int one and that sets up the interrupt for that oops. and again we don't have to deal with int zero because we're not talking about int zero uh, the flags which we don't have to deal with because we're using an ISR okay let's talk uh, briefly about the PC int there are three bits that control it each correspond to the three windows 16 to 23 uh, 8 to 14 and 0 to 7 so you have a width of eight pins that if anyone in that window triggers it will trigger the interrupt and in this case you're restricted to what that what will trigger it and in this case it's just a toggle so if it changes from high to low or low to high you don't have a choice as to which one uh, makes it happen that will throw the interrupt so that's the difference between those two and again it chooses between the three windows 16 to 23 8 to 14 and 0 to 7 uh, but you can specifically control which in those windows will trigger an interrupt so you do have to deal with the entire window but I can say I don't want to deal with 16 through 22. You can just ignore those and only have to deal with 23. So you can get some level of specifics, but this is useful if you want to monitor an entire bus changing, not just a single pin. And again, that works for the three windows. So that's the difference between int and PC int. Okay, so that pretty much sets up those buses or uh, those registers let's gen let's set up the ISR ISR in this case is int 1 vect that should be a T and in this we're just going to say port B XOR equals 1 shifted left to port B 0 and all that's going to do is toggle the pin okay now, if you know anything about digital interrupts, or you don't know anything about digital interrupts, I'm going to inform you anyway. There's an issue called bouncing, and that is when you're triggering this by hand, or sometimes with an external system, it doesn't go quite right the first time, meaning you go to push that button down, and maybe you jitter a bit, maybe the connection's not perfect, and it wiggles a bit in its socket, and it jostles a couple times. It'll actually send multiple triggers this is bad and that's called bouncing because it will go high low high low high low high low high low until it eventually reaches a stable state we have to counteract that in some way first way we did that uh, as well as controlling the floating issue was by enabling the pull-up that helps with debouncing a little bit because floating contributes to a bouncing issue the next way we did that was we chose a logic event which is opposed to the normal logic state of the pin what that means is I've set this 
I've set the pull up, which means it's going to be normally high. And it's the interrupt is only going to be triggered on a low level. So I'm going from high to low, and the falling edge will also work. I'm going from high to low. Rising edge is moving in the same direction. It's going from low to high. It's moving from its low from a low state to its normal state. You want to move in the opposite direction, so you can have as much uh, op so you can have as much contrast as you can. Contrast is a good thing when in a digital system because that's what's going to separate your true from your false and your triggering from your not triggering. Okay, um, next thing I did is I've tested this system and I've tried using a falling edge. Edges are tricky <laughs> because in bouncing you're going to have a lot more edges than levels. Because a falling edge doesn't mean it has to go from a low, a high to a low. It has to start out high and move to a certain point low. It doesn't have to. It has to be. It doesn't have to be stable. It just has to have that edge. So that's a little bit tricky. So by saying it has to be a low level, I'm saying it has to be stable. It has to reach that low level before you trigger that interrupt. So stability all helps to uh, fight bouncing. Next thing I'm going to do is this. I'm going to create a variable called CLI flag. That spells flig. There we go, CLI flag. CLI flag is going to do this. When this triggers, you may have noticed I didn't um, put in the SEI command yet. I'm going to get to that now. What I'm going to say is if CLI flag equals zero, you can go ahead and set the external interrupts. Else, I want you to close the interrupts, and I want you to delay uh, about two seconds. Uh, and then reset yourself. And then in here, I'm going to say CLI flag equals one. So what I'm saying is, in the ISR, I'm going to set this flag after I've toggled port B zero. The reason I have to use an external flag is because if I put CLI in here, as soon as it exits the ISR, it re-enables the global interrupt variable. So it's going to re-enable SEI, figurative, uh, not figurative, in layman's terms. It's going to re-enable that SEI. So what I have to do is say, I know you're going to re-enable the SEI as soon as you leave the ISR, but you have no control over this. So with this variable, I'm going to say close, wait, and then clear again. And what this wait should do is it should eliminate any extra bouncing that might be there. Two, uh, 2,000 milliseconds is a little bit overkill, but it's enough to show you, uh, it's enough to get, this is sort of the poor man's debouncing. There are other ways. You can do this with caps or uh, complex variables, uh, keeping track of the number of times it bounces. This is simple. It's not the optimal way, but it's simple, and it works for our purposes. So I think that does it. I think that takes care of everything. So let's go ahead and compile this, make sure I didn't make any errors. I did make an error. Why did I make an error? Oh, I forgot to include the delay. There we go. Let's try that again. There we go. Everything looks great. So I'll upload this to the board and we'll see what it does. Okay, so here we go. And get the LED. It's on. Ready to go. So if I push the button, so I hold it low, it turns off, it toggles, and I push it again. It turns on. And turn it off. And hold it in again. It turns on. So uh, as you can see, uh, if I hold it down and then immediately push it in again, it takes a while for it to come back on. That's that two millisecond debounce, uh, not two millisecond, two thousand millisecond debouncing thing. So you can see the two thousand milliseconds was really overkill. But again, it's just enough to show that it's enough to make sure that everything's functioning perfectly and everything's working. So there we go. So that is 
external pin interrupts on AVR. So uh, I'm Human Hard Drive. Thanks for watching.